This is Humble Hospitality, episode five. Good evening, DP. Good, I almost said good morning. I'm so used to shooting in the morning. I know. I've seen Mr. you. I, see, I did see you this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Bright and early on a Monday morning. Bright and early. Look at that. After after Valentine's Day yeah. weekend. Yeah, extravaganza. How was your weekend? It was great. Good. It was great. We um, we served a lot of smiles when played at a time to <laughs> a lot of lovebirds over the Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Excellent. It was great. We. Um, it was awesome. First time having having three restaurants firing all cylinders all at once. It was it was spectacular. Great. Yeah, it was really good. The, the team did phenomenal. Um, the best part about it was everybody led. Good. Does that make sense? Yeah. Everybody was leading at all levels of all job codes, and um, uh, I'm I'm really proud of the team. They deserve a ton of shout outs. Um, in addition to shout outs, we've got some people to thank. Not just our team and our great guests that uh. Um, chose to celebrate their Valentines with us, but also um, Ayala Films. Yeah. Got a shout out to Ayala Films for okay. um, handling all of our podcasts, all mm -hmm. of our audio, visual, and um, being our, uh, our videographer of choice for a promenade. So when you do wedding and corporate events, they'll be taking care of us. So um, thank you, Andres. Appreciate it. Andres, if you can figure it out, you can link yourself right here. <laughs> yeah. I'm not doing it. <laughs> so, you know, and, um, you know, hey, you know, you know who else we got to thank? We've got to thank, um, we, we've got to thank just everybody in Florida who's, you know, handling all this pandemic stuff as best as possible and allowing us to stay open and, and, and handle our businesses, you know. Absolutely. Um, uh, the real MVPs. Yeah. Yeah. We've, um, we've been very fortunate, uh, all of us, you know, a lot of people didn't have the Valentine's Day we had. So i um, very thankful and, and you know, no pun intended, but humbled to yeah. be able to, um, you know, serve our guests, you know, at, at, at the level in which we're accustomed. So awesome. um, it's great. Thank you guys for coming out. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. And uh, we'll, we'll do it again this weekend. You listen, Valentine's you don't need Valentine's Day, Day to be in love. So, <laughs> uh, but you do need trust. And today we're going to talk a little bit about trust as we continue our journey through our leadership toolbox. Um, through the 21 Laws of Leadership. Originally, we were supposed to be three episodes, <laughs> seven chapters each. Didn't, didn't get there. No. No, you kept me talking for too long. No, yeah, I, I, I talk <laughs> so much. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you kept me yeah. talking for too long. Um, so we got through five chapters in three episodes. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is going to chapter six, and it's titled The Law of Solid Ground. Trust is the Foundation of Leadership. Right. And when we think about leadership or leadership is the way to, to wait, the way to describe leadership is, is, is it is a relationship between one person and an individual or a group of individuals. Right. And then so on and so forth. I mean, that it could be, you can just hierarchy that or pyramid that if you will. Um, when you think about like ranks within a within an organization, um, but it's it's you need trust. You need trust in any relationship, including leadership. Mm -hmm. You need. I would I would think you need trust in any form of ship, even if it was a boat in the water. You need to trust it's not going to sink. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Spaceship. You need to trust that it's airtight or you're you're in trouble. Yeah. So you need to have trust. You need to have trust in those that are working in your ship, mm -hmm. whether it's a boat or in a leadership position. Mm -hmm. That was fun. That was I've fun. waited all week to say that. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but seriously, I mean, think about it. a relationship, whether it's a friendship, ooh, more ships, lots of ships going around the lots sea right now. No, but if it's a friendship, if it's a um, relationship, like, like intimate relationship, you need to have trust, right? And one of the things that we all know, because I'm sure we've all experienced it at some point, is trust is really hard to build and to retain it's very easy to lose, right? You can lose oh, yeah. trust like that. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, not to get, you know, we could sit here for hours, talk about personal stories, but uh, of all of us, and I'm sure everyone listening to this could as well, um, and I know that we're human. There's all been times where, where we've lost the trust of someone mm -hmm. through actions we've done or, actions, or, or we've lost, they've lost our trust, right? So prefacing that um, trust is very crucial. And when you look at it from the, through the lens of leadership, it's even more crucial because 
not only do you have to trust your team, but your team has to trust you. So a lot of times, you know, leaders, uh, new leaders, like, oh, well, they need to respect me, or they, I'm the boss. That's the wrong way to do it. Yeah. You know, or they don't know what they're doing. Well, do you trust them to do it? Did you let them go? Did you give them clear direction? Did you let them try to do it? Well, if they're not doing my plan, well, does, why does that have to be your plan? It doesn't need to be your plan, does it? It doesn't need to be your plan. Let it be their plan. You've got to trust them to do it. In order to do that, you've got to give them the tools, the training, clear direction, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and there's a litany of other things that are going to come with that that we're going to explore. Um, but we're going to get into chapter six. And I'm actually, as I've, as I mentioned, as we go through this in a couple episodes, and I'm not reading you the whole book. You have to buy the book. Um, John Maxwell is an excellent author. He has lots of books for you to read. Um, I've only read a handful of all of his books. Hopefully one day I can read them all. But I'm really pulling some, some specific things out of here, out of here um, that I want to go through and discuss and more or less paraphrase a couple things because it's a great book and I don't want them to sue me. <laughs> so, so there's that. Uh, but, you know. Have them for dinner, not for a lawsuit. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, getting into the book here, it says, trust is the foundation of leadership. To build trust, a leader must exemplify these qualities. Competence, connection, and character. Oh. Covered those. We've covered those a lot, right? And just a little different word, just a little different phrase. We say, right, uh, you know, and I go back to this all the time um, with my team here. Jimmy Nuss says you need character, competence, and relational connection. Well, John Maxwell's saying those three things right there. And really for me, if you want to paint the three pillars of leadership in a broad strokes, you need those three things, period. Otherwise, if you're not a good person, if you don't say what you do, do what you say. If you don't have a relationship with the individuals you're trying to lead, whether up, down, or lateral on the chain of command, or you don't have the skill set to do that job, or you, you're not bringing in someone that has the skill set to do the job, you're done. And I think we've covered this in the past. You know, leadership, when, when you take these things, um, and, and this, is, this is right from Jimmy Knott, he says, you know, it can't be, the equation isn't competence plus connection plus character. It's competence times connection times character equals your leadership value, right? So, so if any one of those is a zero, anything times zero is zero, therefore your leadership ability is a zero. Mm -hmm. You with me? So if you were to you know, go on a one through 10 scale and boom, 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 one of those is zero, you're done. Your leadership effectiveness is gonna be shot. You're not, you're not leading, you're just you're going for a walk and you're gonna turn around, no one's behind you. Getting back to the book, one of my favorite chapters. It's all about character. You, gotta, yeah. you can't trust someone with poor character. No. People will forgive occasional mistakes based on ability, especially if they can see that you're still growing as a leader. But they won't trust someone who has slips in character. In that area, even occasional lapses are lethal. All effective leaders know this truth. PepsiCo chairman and CEO Craig Weatherup acknowledges that people will tolerate honest mistakes but if you violate their trust and you will find it very difficult to ever regain their confidence. That is one reason that you need to treat trust as your most precious asset. You may fool your boss, but you can never fool your colleagues or subordinates. Right? So your colleagues and subordinates, they're watching you every minute. They can smell your character. They're, they're paying attention to what you do, what you say, who you say it to, who you don't say it to. And it's our subconscious human nature that picks that up, our, our, our little radar, right? Mm -hmm. And um, that's key because as a leader, what you learn is you learn that you are now having to understand and plan for all the subconscious, um, what's the word I'm looking for? All the subconscious uh, projections and, and things that your subordinates and colleagues are putting on you that they don't even know that they're actively doing. Does that make sense? Right. So I do this and then, oh, they do that. And it's like, well, what happened? Well, they're watching you, they're following you. And had you not done this thing or had you been more aware of it, you could have planned for it. And, right. and it, it's, it's, it's really interesting, which is what makes leadership so challenging for people because they can't understand that they're fighting against the subconscious of those individuals trying to show them a better way, but it's innate in our, in our human DNA. So you've got to understand, that's why it's so important to understand the tools in the toolbox so that you can utilize them and leverage them and be aware of your own self, right? Right. Hardest person leads yourself. <coughs> Excuse me. 
General Norman J Norman H. Sorpskoff points to the significance of character. And he quote, he's quoted saying, leadership is a potent combination of strategy and character, but if you must be without one, be without strategy. I like that. It's deep. Yeah. Character and leadership credibility always go hand in hand. Anthony Harrigan, president of the U.S. Bureau, I'm sorry, U.S. Business and Industrial Council said, the role of character always has been the key factor in the rise and fall of nations. And one can be sure that America is no exception for this rule of history. We won't survive as a country because we are smarter or more sophisticated, but because we are, we hope, stronger inwardly. In short, character is the only effective bulwark against internal and external forces that lead to a country's disintegration or collapse. Again, this book was written in 1997. Um, and I'm not sure, I didn't research Anthony Harrigan, I probably should have, mm. but you think about this was written 24 years ago, and you think about, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Has the character of our country, <laughs> leadership, and I'm gonna say political, and in the media, and I say, when I talk about media, I talk about like celebrities and all mm -hmm. these people that we all look to, that the, that, that the American population looks to as leaders, Yeah. Has the character gotten, in your opinion, better or worse? I'm gonna say exponentially worse, and I will not be giving <laughs> any examples. Because much like Mr. Maxwell, you don't wanna see his name on a lawsuit. I don't think I could handle one from anybody I could name for any of the innumerable amount of reasons of how poor their leadership is. It's fair. Yeah. It's fair, right? So. So, but so when you think about what he says here is, is like, you know, we won't survive if we don't have good character as, as, as a nation. Mm -hmm. So, so if that's true for a country, wouldn't that be true for an organization, a team, a business, right? You can see how that applies. John Maxwell goes on to say, character makes trust possible and trust makes leadership possible. That is the law of solid ground. Um, and, and, and he goes into, he goes into some uh, examples here. And, and so I highlighted a bunch of stuff. The character communicates, it's the name of the section here. Whenever you lead people, it's as if they consent to take a journey with you. The way that trip is going to turn out is predicted by your character. With good character, the longer the trip is, the better it gets. But if your character is flawed, the, and the longer the trip is, the worse it will seem to them. Why? Because no one enjoys spending time with someone he doesn't trust. Character communicates many things to followers. Character communicates consistency, right? So now we're taking character, competency, and connection, breaking it down, mm -hmm. right? Character communicates consistency. Leaders without inner strength can't be counted on day after day because their ability to perform change, or their ability to perform changes constantly. NBA great Jerry West commented, you can't get too much done in life if you only work on the days when you feel good. If your people don't know what to expect from you as a leader, at some point they won't look to you for leadership. So if you're inconsistent as a leader, if you're good one day, but then the next day you don't feel like it, and you're kind of just going through the motions and not being effective, when they come to you, when, when your team comes to you, again, whether they're people that you are, are in direct responsibility of and, and their supporters, or, or your, your boss comes to you, or, or your peer comes to you, and one day you give a stellar performance, and the next day you can't make Gouda au gratins to save your life, right? Yeah. Think about it from a line cook perspective or, or you know, all of a sudden what happens? Are, are you going to go to that person or are you going to be expected to, you know, get those tasks and jobs if, and, and those opportunities if you can't be counted on day after day? And then think right. about it when it comes time to make raises or promotions or bonuses or whatever it is when, when, when that superior, that boss, that owner, that CEO, whatever it is, is going back and saying, man, you know what? I could really count on Johnny. He was, he, was, he was on fire. Every time I went to him, boom, he got it done. And even though he might have struggled and needed help, I know I can consistently rely on him. But then you've got you know, Timmy over here who he's like, man, one day he just knocks it out of the park. And then like the whole last week, yeah. I, I probably should have just sent him home because, because he was more in the way than anything. You know, who's getting that promotion? Who's getting that opportunity? Who's getting that, the perks of going the extra? Right. doing the extra, doing that, just that extra, forget the extra mile, that extra inch, like that extra minute of just paying attention to those details and being consistent. Mm -hmm. 
I consistently get the soup around, you know? <laughs> I consistently consistent. put more chairs in your uh, domain to deal with. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Got yeah. a big, big one this week. Two hundred and fifty chairs. I trust you chairs. to bring me chairs. Yeah. Well, I trust you to get them <laughs> taken care of. Character communicates potential. John Morley observed: No man can climb out beyond the limitations of his own character. That's especially true when it comes to leadership, right? So, no man can climb out beyond the limitations of his own character. Kind of sounds. Like, the only limits on yourself are the ones you put on yourself. And if you start with your character, then you can find out where your limits mm -hmm. are. Bruce Lee said, this isn't in the book, but Bruce Lee used to say, you know, I don't know if, if, if you know this, but um, he, when he kind of created his martial arts style, which is funny because he relates it to not as a style, but more of a, of a methodology, you know, Jeet Kune Do, he says, use no way as way, no limitation as limitation. So if you can have good character, in theory, you could have no limitation. Jeet Kune Do translates to way of the intercepting fist because he took strategies and techniques of all the martial arts, blended it together and said, there are no forms, there's no belts, there's no katas, there's no nothing. We're just going to do good martial arts, effective martial arts. You need to gouge someone in the eye or bite them, do it, but whatever it takes. Because it was in his mind, it was life and death, right? So how I make that, that, that parallel is the only limitations we set on ourselves are the, or the only limitations we have are the ones we set on ourselves. So if we can harness our character and focus it and, and make it that it's great character and we treat people with respect and we treat people with integrity and we do what we say, you are releasing the chains of that limitation and removing that lid and from there it's it's up mm -hmm. yeah then the key is to stay humble right and keep that character consistent right which goes back to what we just said all the wisdom of life here on humble hospitality i love it character communicates respect that's why i like this one when you don't have strength within you cannot earn respect without. And respect is absolutely essential for lasting leadership. How do leaders earn respect? By making sound decisions, competency, admitting their mistakes, character, and putting what's best for their followers and the organization ahead of their personal agendas. Connection. Right? Yeah. So you're a new leader, right? And you're like, come to me, man, I can't get anyone to respect me. No, no one's listening. You need to go tell them that, that you're my dad. I'm the boss. What am I going to say? I'm going to say, well. <laughs> figure it out. Well, I'm going to say figure it out. And then I'm going to say, let me help you here. Let me help you figure it out. I'm going to say, are you, are, are you strong within? Have you given them respect? Have you made sound decisions? Have you admitted, admitted a mistake when you made it? Not to me to your team and who saw the mistake. It's okay, just like, we, like, like he said. He said, they'll forgive you for making a mistake, especially as they see you growing as a leader. Own it. You know how many times I've made mistakes in the last three and a half years with the team here in the restaurant? A lot. Sometimes we made big mistakes. Who did it affect more, them or me? It affected them. They were the ones on the front lines. So, oh, you know, hey, guys, my bad. I own it. It wasn't your fault. Yeah. I got it. My name is on the door. I got it. I'll take ownership. I appreciate your support and having my back. Here's what I'm going to do to fix it. You know what they said? They said, cool, boss. We got your back. No problem. Yeah. We'll help you figure it out. And I was like, all right, great. Perfect, because I need the team, right? That's about it. I got, that's all I got on trust. That's it. There's more in the book, and he's got a couple other examples. Um, which I thought were which I thought were pretty great. You know, a lot of them were uh, actually the next one was about um, some examples in the Vietnam War. Um, but I chose not to not to bring it in to our uh, episode today. Partly because I don't want to spoil the book. You got to buy the book and read the book. You'll get a lot more out of the book than you will get out of our never-ending coverage of episodes on the podcast here. <laughs> um, I promise the podcast is about more than just this book. It is. It will be uh, once we get through it. But, you know, again, going back to why are we putting so much into this book? Um, we put a lot into this book because of the fact that this is one of the things that I give all my leaders, um, whether they're new in a leadership or they're, or they're coming on and they've been in management, because I want them to really understand that these are very 
powerful tools and they really open up the door to how to how to maneuver yourself as a leader right especially if you listen to episode two you talk about managing oneself i'm the hardest person to lead and how important it is and how critical it is to have that leadership capacity by leading yourself right then what happens is is when you can figure out okay i need to have enough discipline to lead myself but what do i do from there here's your roadmap Right. And then you can get into the, the, the more intricate, not that this is a very challenging process, but it's, it's a mentally tough concept, which is why there's so much material about it. But what's funny is when you read it all, they're all saying the same thing. It's just which one resonates for you and, and where do you grasp it better? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, listen, I've got, you saw my house today. I got yeah. piles of books all over the place yeah. just waiting in line to go through this. So we've got lots of material to go through. I don't think we're ever gonna run out of episode material. <laughs> So you're stuck with me every week. Oh, excellent. <laughs> what do you think about trust? Important? Very. Yeah, I mean, if you can't, listen, if you can't step away from your line in the back because you can't trust that someone can heat up lobster mac and cheese and put it on a plate, then... I like where this is going. You're giving me an idea. Because I was going to ask you a question, but I'm going to ask you the question after we talk about, after we talk about this. So, so... I didn't think of it from that way, and you just brought up a good idea. What a, the antitrust factor, mm -hmm. right? And not even, not even from subordinate to, 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 to leader, but what about leader to subordinate? And going through, if I can't trust my team to make mac and cheese or whatever it is we're making, what does that say about me as a leader? If I can't trust my team? Well, there are no bad, <laughs> there's, there are no bad teams, only bad leaders, right? Right. It just means that you could be, I won't go as far as saying a bad leader. You could have missed this. Ineffective. Step. Ineffective. Yeah. You could right. Go back maybe and revisit. Right. Because because a bad leader, I think, would would indicate maybe that that's a that that leader has poor character. Right. right. But they might be ineffective just because maybe they're not a personal person. They haven't spent time, or they don't even know. No one told them. Hey, go make connections. Go get involved with your people on the front line. Go to that guy, and be like, Hey, Jack. Let's yeah. make some mac and cheese together and let me show you how to do this. And by the way, how are the kids? Did you right. get, you know, hey, I know you've been working a lot. Good job, thank you. You're gonna get a good overtime. And if you need some time off next week, I'll try to give you an extra day or a half day or something. Mm -hmm. Boom, instant relational connection. That's a little leadership capital deposit, right? So, but again, if that ineffective leader doesn't build that relational connection, maybe that leader doesn't know how to make a mac and cheese themselves. So what should they do? Should they go ask the guy who knows how to make the mac and cheese. Say, hey, Jimmy, show me how to make a mac and cheese. Because when you're on the line, I have no mac and cheese issues. But when Jack's on the line, I think he needs to learn and show me because you do it better than me. It's OK. Do you know how much respect and trust you get from your subordinates, especially if you're in a leadership position and you go and ask them how to do their job? Mm -hmm. Hey, can you show me? You, you've got a higher skill set. <laughs> Perfect example. Yesterday, Valentine's Day, I walked into Hutch's kitchen. We were a little short-staffed. Um, <laughs> we were a little short-staffed uh, only because, you know what, it, it's, we've, we did as many people in a day yesterday that we usually do over like five days. It was tremendous. And so I walked in there for brunch, and as I'm pretty sure we've covered this in the podcast, but I'm not a bartender. I like the side of the bar with the seats. I hate being behind the bar. I, 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 the people that talk to me that I'm stuck and trapped, and then I'm like, look at it, and I'm like, I don't know what to do. Like, it's, it's, you gotta lead yourself when you're back there. Oh, I try really hard. <laughs> but you know what? I also don't have the competency, right? So I've, I have a bit of bartender. I can make a good mojito. I can make a good glass of wine. I can engage the guests. I talk, I ring orders in, you know? And, and so we had one bartender. We, we, were, we, were, we were busy yesterday. And so, so I asked April, our front house manager, I said, April, you can bartend. I'm like, come back here, right? And, um, and we were just getting busy. We were short staff. So um, I was jumping around, and, and I reached out to, to uh, David Tufts, Dragon. And mm -hmm. I said, hey, man. Uh, actually, I saw him in the parking lot because I was coming back because I stole the bar back from Kyle G's. I'm okay. like, you're working at the kitchen. He goes, when? I'm like, now. So shout out to Kennedy. Thank you for saving uh, Valentine's out of kitchen. I'm like, now, like right now, I'm like, drop everything. I need you. And I'm going back across the street. It was great. I love it. I love the, the controlled chaos of the restaurant <laughs> industry. And uh, I see Dragon. He's like, hey, what do you need? I'm like, I need you to come bartend out of the kitchen. Now, he's our bar manager here, as you know, but those that listening may not know that. 
And so he's like, all right. I'm like, yeah, dude, Mimosa's Buddy Mary's, figure it out. Uh, there's recipe cards in the box, uh, go. And I'm like, I can't, because you're going to be, he's got the skill set to do it. I don't, you know what I mean? So I'm like, hey, you do that. And then fortunately, we had that. This is perfect cover and move execution, like instant, because the chef had to get on the line to go help out because they were just busy, right? Yeah. And I think we had a guy that wasn't feeling good or whatever. So, um, so we got him a little bit, a little bit of a breather. Chef David got on, so I was helping him run the window, and um, you know, I was just like, "Hey, man, I need, I, I need you up." Dave Lovett came in. We had representations of all three restaurants in our little ten seat bar at Hutchinson <laughs> Kitchen, just <laughs> making it happen, just going to work. It was awesome. But that's the teamwork, you know, right. that's that pulling together. But I trusted them, even though they, neither Dave Lovett, our, our beverage director, uh, shout out to Dave Lovett, I think you're gonna be on the next episode, by the way. And, and uh, Dragon, who's also gonna be on some episodes. Um, neither one of them worked a day over there, but I trusted them and they trusted me enough to be like, you know what, sure, we got you. Yeah. And then they were able to, Bloody Mary's Mimosas for brunch, they were able to get that done while our bartender was able to kind of get a little bit sorted and get her bearings and mm -hmm. and again being short staff so it so it worked but it was it was, it was great um, it, it was really cool but I'm gonna touch back on the antitrust thing real quick because I got off topic because I got a little excited no oh. <clears throat> yeah I seem to do that right yes uh, <laughs> Jesus um, the antitrust thing if you can't trust your team to manage and you can't trust your team to lead at the level that they need to lead at again you got to look at yourself and you got to serve yourself your first piece of humble pie and say what am I not giving clear direction am I not giving tools am I not following up with them what was their training like and do I, and how's my relationship with this individual maybe I need to build a better relationship and it could be with, again with people that you're directly responsible for you make their schedule you you teach them you train them you guide them or it could be your colleagues next to you I'm really frustrated. This guy doesn't know anything I'm doing. Show him what you're doing. Say, hey man, come over here. Let me show you some of the things that I'm working on so you get a better idea and understanding. And, and by the way, show me what you're working on in your department. And all of a sudden, boom. Again, you, you know, maybe you're new, like I am, to bartending. I, don't, I, I have no desire to do it. It's not, it's not my strength and so strong suit. You, you know what happens when I go and, and I ask my bar team, hey guys, what are you doing? Show me what you need. Can I, what, what can I do for you? Can you show me how to make this drink? Because I think it tastes great, um, but I'd really like to know how to make it. They're like, wait, you, you don't know? Or, or, or as the boss or, or, or as a front house manager, wait, you don't know how to make this? No. But you're my boss. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to get, we're, we're dialing into a lot more cross-training and what we do. Mm -hmm. We're still young in our organization. We're, we're building it. We're growing it. But, you know, it's important for them to understand. You get so much buy-in. Or, hey, you know, I know how to make it, but can you show me how to do it? Because yours are really good, whatever it is. And it's like, boom, instant buy-in. And, and, and I feel like that's kind of a cheat code, the relational connection. It's, it's the hardest thing for somebody when you give them power. The first thing they want to do is just disavow anybody there. And correct. A lot of corporations, if they promote you as a manager, they move you because they Correct. already know how much of a hassle. Well, because you have those relationships. You, have, you, you could have poor relationships or you have comfortable relationships mm -hmm. where, where people will kind of take advantage of. And then what happens is it's good for that one individual, but mm -hmm. it's bad for the rest of the team. Right. And, and, and that's, that's certainly a challenge for, for new leaders. And, and actually, it's funny, um, my uncle is in the, um, well, he's retired now, but he got pretty high up in the National Guard in New Jersey. And we were talking about leadership and promotions and and he said yeah he goes same thing with us and in, in, in national guard military he's like you know if you're getting promoted the guys you came up with usually they they, they slide you over uh, at darden there was there was a rule like you couldn't be a manager um you couldn't be a manager in the building that you were an hourly and only very rare did it ever like if they were like ultra short staffed or something that did, did they did they allow it so um now that we have multiple locations we're going to get into that but again we've got it we've got to start somewhere in our mm -hmm. in our quest quest for leadership quest. Um, you had a question for me I had a question yeah question was having gone through this so far the last couple episodes and dealing with me often on a daily basis and seeing you get to what's cool is you have a very unique position in our organization because you get to see it all kind of from an outside perspective so imagine someone comes to you and says Oh, these guys aren't respecting me. Da, 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 da. What do you tell them? Me? 
Well, you want my real answer? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, my real answer is I've literally told people, hey, you should probably listen to the podcast. It's got some good stuff on <laughs> it's there. Great for answer. You. I'll take it. It's, it's dead serious. Um, you should also buy a shirt too called Humble Pie. Yeah. It sounds like you need some. It, that's the first thing is, hey, well, um, and I've already had this. Hey, can you talk to so and so? They're not listening to me. And I'll ask, you know, why are they not listening? I don't know. Okay, well, what have you done to get through to them? Have you spoke with them? What's what's their problem? You know, and there's some issues where it's, well, I won't bore anybody with the details, but it, it look, you already look in your watch. I talked for two seconds. <laughs> no, I want to make sure we hit your time constraints that were. Come on. So um, I am so going to break your time constraints. Yeah, no worries. T- tell your couch to figure it out. Yeah, my couch will figure it out. Uh, but the answer is, you know, I, I ask them the same things that we, we talk about here. Well, why why do you think they're not, you know, working well? Why are they are they not respecting you? Were, were they taught? You know, did you just say, hey, go make salads? And then they said, okay, hey, I don't know how to make salads. Well, it's salads. Okay, well, you didn't teach them right. how to plate the salad. You don't know. They see a ticket come in. They don't know if it's a wedge. They don't know if it's spring mix. They, you know, they're yeah. just seeing make salad with this. <laughs> they don't know. Well, you didn't tell them. So think about it. Have you done anything to relate to them? And, especially, you know, especially in this industry, people, you have people from all different temperaments and mindsets and, and all types of different you, attitudes that's what I was raising. that's what I was that's what I wanted and, you to, you, to pull out there uh, oh, exactly exactly good. that no you, you got it and you got to really I mean not I don't want to go as far as saying stroke your ego but you got to play to play to their strengths and understand where their strengths are and then you know maybe get them to hey all right well hey if they they're somebody who cries as soon as they think they're wrong you have to assure them that they've done all these things right but so maybe this part so it's needs- so so and this is the this is the thing that most people don't realize as leaders and again subconsciously they don't realize it they'll think that now that they're a leader now that they're a manager now that they're the boss <laughs> right boss <laughs> now that they're in charge they're in a title of power they have the the name on the card their jacket whatever mm-hmm. right a little plaque on their desk that says i'm in charge they think that everyone should conform to them, right? right? And their personality. <laughs> if you couldn't see that, that's his business card holder with, yeah. uh, with name and title on it, which I love. And, but that's good. This is a sense of pride. Mm-hmm. Here's the deal. What most people fail to realize, and it's not like whenever, you know, whenever anyone gets promoted, usually there's not like a little like a disclaimer that just pops out of nowhere that says you need to know all the and all this fine print that comes out. Yeah. So what ha- and that's what the podcast is for. So you could listen to that disclaimer and listen to us go on for hours about this. This is life's disclaimer of leadership mm-hmm. through humble the pie. <laughs> So, but what happens is, in reality, what they should do is they should conform themselves and their personalities to their team members. The only way to do that is to drop your ego, Mm -hmm. right? And most people can't do that because I'm right, I'm the boss, I'm me, me, me. Well, it's not about you. It's about your team's success. And if you can't talk to Susie, Jack, Mike, Mo, Barry, Lisa, and Tim, and understand how to communicate with them as individuals and you're going to have to have nine you're going to be saying the same thing but you're going to say it nine different ways be based on and the only way you know how to do that is through relational connection which builds the trust which allows you to exponentially grow your leadership capability but if you go and say the same thing the same way through because of your ego and your mentality and me 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 my my mind you're going to say it nine times one person's going to hear you if you're lucky and then now nobody knows how to do it. And now whose fault is it? Because they don't know how to do what they're doing that you told them how to do. It's, well, who told them how to do what they're doing that they don't know how to do? Well, you. So whose fault is it? Now, there is a time that comes where you have to sit that person down and say, hey, Doug, listen, I've given you clear direction. Sure, I've given we're doing you- this right now. <laughs> I've given you clear direction. I've given you the tools. I have followed up with you. I have helped you. I have, we've made concessions A, B, C, D. You're still not accomplishing the objective as needed, or you're still not completing your job to the, the expectations or the standards that, that we require here. What part of it aren't you getting, right? That's the conversation that needs to have. How can I help you? And then after you have that, that's when you can start to make the disciplinary and the termination factors. But I told the guy how to do this three times. 
okay, maybe, how do they learn? Do you know anything about them? Maybe, maybe they need to literally do it with you. Maybe they need to see it. Maybe they need to read it. Maybe, I, you know, for me, I would go and write the recipes. Right. And I made flashcards. And I would go and I'd write the recipe and I'd make flashcards and boom, 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 and I'd carry them with me. And when I needed to make the thing, I'd go, I'd pull out my flashcard and I'd be like, oh yeah, six cups of this, four gallons of that, boom, boom, boom. Hey, here's a, here's a couple key steps to the recipe. And then, and then I'd go make the sauce or the item or whatever. Mm -hmm. And for me, that helped. So um, everyone's different, but if you don't build those relational connections and if you don't have the trust of your team or you don't give them the trust, but you, in, you're not gonna have it. And, and I'm getting ahead of myself here, but if you don't give them the trust because you can't trust them, then that means you don't trust yourself because you know you didn't give good direction. You're like, go make salads, figure it out. Go heat yeah. up the mac and cheese. How much mac and cheese? How many noodles? How much sauce? How much sauce? I don't know. Uh, make it look nice. Well, what if they put too much? Now your food cost is messed up. Now this, now that. Now maybe they're not, maybe they're taking it's 10. Little and now your people are pissed Yeah, off exactly. And maybe they're taking 10 extra steps and no wonder why the guy can't get mac and cheese out on a busy night. So, so these are the things that you can just continue to refine it and just dial it down and people, they don't get that. They're like, oh, well, they should just do it because I said so. Or, or the best is like, well, I had to learn this way. Well, that's you. And how, how good was that? Did that suck? Yeah, that sucked. So why would you do that to the guy you're trying to rely on? Make it easier for him. Make it better for them. It's crazy. Well, I had to learn. And, and you know what? I used to say that. I, 10 years ago, I used to say Five years ago, I probably said it. I'm like, well, I had to. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. That, that doesn't really work. <laughs> I mean, it might work for somebody, but is it, is it, is it the right way to do it? <laughs> well, yeah. I'm sure that, I'm gonna, oh yeah, 20 thumbs up on this video because I just said it builds character. <laughs> well, yeah, there are some things, but those are things you got to go no, to. No, of course. That's, 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 that's completely different than what we're talking about. You, but somebody yeah. will go off on that same tangent thinking that. That'll be a whole other chapter, be character building. Well, I mean, why don't we, we are talking about character. Yeah. But it's about character building. That's, that's a whole other day. you gotta, got to do hard things. Yeah. got to do hard things. You want to build your character. you got to test your character. Yeah. That's the secret. Yeah. And as you a gotta team. Be, you got to be prepared to work really, really hard. Yeah, show up early, stay late, get it done. Out work. I saw, I saw a thing I shared on Facebook the other day. It said, out, reminder, like it was coming up on a, on a phone. I don't have an iPhone, so I'm assuming it's an iPhone because it doesn't look like my reminders. But it said, it said a reminder, outwork everyone. And I was like, boom, it's excellent. I shared it and then I went to the gym and I was like, I hope my trainer doesn't see this today. <laughs> yeah. I'll get it the next day. He saw it. I like the other he version gave me of that. <clears throat> it says, um, work harder, no one gives a shit. Yeah, it's true. David Lovett has that on a, a coffee mug. I love, I love inspirational mugs in the morning. Inspirational. Speaking of inspirational, <clears throat> chapter seven. And I wrote a little note here about chapter seven before we get into chapter seven, before I even go into the title of it. Actually, you know what? I will say the title, and then I'm going to read my note. I'm going to change up my game plan here. Okay. Chapter seven is The Law of Respect. People naturally follow leaders stronger than themselves. It's a fair statement. Mm -hmm. Love it. We're a little, a little yeah. restaurant noise Absolutely. in the background. It's the real deal. It we're just in it. Adds to the rawness. Well, well listen, we're get, we're get, we're getting Between the pot. my throat that always never wants to work for some reason. I'm gonna rephrase that. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, something you want to tell us? <laughs> My voice seems to escape me every time that I get in front of a camera. All right. Well, you know what's good is we're here. We're doing the podcast here yeah. at Kyle G's after we just had a tremendous weekend. And as soon as we finish the podcast, it's time to go out there and get on the front lines and go build trust and relationships with our team and our community. That's what's going to happen today. Excellent. We're, we're going to make it happen. Um, back to my note. So the law of respect. People naturally follow leaders stronger than themselves. And the reason why I like this chapter is unlike some of the other um, examples and stories uh, in this book, this one is exclusively about life and death, right? And I think about uh, leadership as, as, as really kind of, you know, a life and death of an organization, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, everything rises and falls with leadership. So if, if an organization, whether it's a restaurant, a car dealership, a financial company, a manufacturing, agriculture, whatever, it's going gonna, it's gonna to only be limited by its leadership ability at the top, right? Which is why we covered, you know, when people want to make changes, they remove the leader and then they, they put a new leader in so we can go a new direction. You know, 
but when you think of life and death examples um, and, and the leadership required, it really puts it into, into a very um, human context. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's like, oh, great, the leadership was great at, you know, whatever, GM, so, you know, in the 60s, so they were a great company. Oh, they made a bunch of money. Oh, you know, the leadership at, you know, Apple, Steve Jobs is great, They're like, whatever. That's great, they made a bunch of money, these a bunch of guys got rich, whatever, right? Here, when you, when you relate it through, through life and death scenarios, it's just so human that um, I, think it, I think it really makes people stop and understand how ingrained in our DNA as human beings this is over, over millennia. Does that make right. sense? And so um, I've got a lot highlighted here, so I'm, I'm going to get into it. Um, and, and I'm going to read this. It's, it's, I'm really excited about this chapter because the story is, we all know the story. That's funny. We all know the story. Um, but I don't think we, I don't think it's, I don't think that it's the details that we go through in this chapter are as known or as widely remembered as, as some of the things that, that John Maxwell highlights here. Um, and, 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 and it's absolutely tremendous. And, um, again, the law of respect, having not ever met this person, uh, a tremendous amount of respect for, for, for this individual. I certainly have. I mean, I always have, but after reading this, I, I like stopped. I was like, whoa. Like, whoa. Like, I don't even know what I would do in this scenario. So I'm gonna get into it, because it's, it's legit. Uh, yeah, yeah, ready. So, if you had seen her, your first reaction might not have been respect. She wasn't a very impressive looking woman, just a little over five feet tall in her late 30s with dark brown weathered skin. She couldn't read or write. The clothes she wore were coarse and worn, although they were neat. When she smiled, people could see that her top two front teeth were missing. She lived alone. The story was that she had abandoned her husband when she was 29. She gave him no warning. One day he woke up and she was gone. She talked to him only once after that. Years later, and she never mentioned his name again afterward. Her employment was intermittent. Most of the time she took the domestic jobs in small hotels, scrubbing floors, making up rooms, and cooking. But just about every spring and fall, she would disappear from her place of employment, come back broke, and work again to scrape together what little money she could. When she was present on the job, she worked hard and seemed physically tough. But she was but she also was known to have bouts where she would suddenly fall asleep, some coming in the mid, uh, fall asleep, coming in the middle of a conversation. She attributed her affliction to a blow to the head she took in during a teenage fight. Who would respect a woman like that? The answer is the more than 300 slaves who followed her to freedom out of the South. They recognized and respected her leadership. So did just about every abolitionist in New England. The year is 1857. This woman's name was Harriet Tubman, right? So you, the, the title is, is uh, of this or, uh, chap section in the chapter here is called A Leader by another, by another Name, or Any Other Name, excuse me. While she was only in her 30s, Harriet Tubman came to be called Moses because of her ability to go into the land of captivity and bring so many of her people out of slavery's bondage. Tubman started life as a slave. She was born in 1820, and she grew up in the farmland of Maryland, of Maryland. When she was 13, she received the blow to her head that troubled her all her life. She was in a store, and a white overseer demanded her assistance so that, sorry, so that he could beat an escaping slave. When she refused and blocked the overseer's way, the man threw a two-pound weight that hit Tubman in the head. She nearly died, and her recovery took months. At age 24, she married John Tubman, a free black man. But when she talked to him about escaping to freedom in the North, he wouldn't hear of it. He said that if she tried to leave, he'd turn her in. When she resolved to take her chances and go North in 1849, she did so alone without a word to him. Her first biographer, Sarah Bradford, said that Tubman told her, I had reason this out in my mind. There was one of two things I had a right to, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other for no man should take me alive. I should fight for my liberty as my strength lasted, and when the time came for me to go, the Lord would let them take me. 
Tubman made her way to uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania via the Underground Railroad, a secret network of free blacks, white abolitionists, and Quakers who helped escaping slaves on the run. Though free herself, she vowed to return to Maryland and bring her family out. In 1850, she made her first return trip as an Underground Railroad conductor, someone who retrieved and guided out slaves with the assistance of sympathizers along the way. Oh, there's more. There's a lot more. But just that, like people today, like, I mean, think of these challenges and the time of the world. Yeah. And she's like, no, not happening. Like, I, the willpower of that and, and, and the uh, determination is just tremendous. Think about how scary that must be at that time. Yeah. We go on. A leader of steel. Each summer and winter, Tubman worked as a domestic, scraping together the funds she needed to make return trips to the South. In every spring and fall, she risked her life by going South and returning with more people. She was fearless, and her leadership was unshakable. It was extremely dangerous work, and when people in, in her charge wavered, she was strong as steel. Tubman knew escaped slaves who returned would be beaten and tortured until they gave information about those who had helped them. So she never allowed any people she was guiding to give up. Dead folks tell, tell no tales, she would tell a faint-hearted slave as she put a loaded pistol to his head. You go on or die. Between 1850 and 1860, Harriet Tubman guided out more than 300 people, including many of her own family members. She made 19 trips in all and was very proud of the fact she never once lost a single person under her care. I never ran my train off the track, she said. I never lost a passenger. Southern whites put a $12,000 bounty on her head, a fortune at that time. Southern blacks simply called her Moses. By the start of the Civil War, she had brought more people out of slavery than any other American in history, black or white, male or female. Damn. Th I mean, it's... Yeah, they don't teach you that, huh? No, they don't. They, they don't they're not teaching you that in high school, in high school yeah. history. They're like, you know, I mean, <clears throat> you get the headlines. But, and, and that's what I was talking about, like, you know, after reading this, I was like, I mean, like, don't worry, there's more. But, uh, you know, reading this, I'm like, my God, like, I mean, obviously we know what happened at the time was wrong. We know that it was horrible. And, and there's countless of stories of, of, of how horrendous this was. But, you know, when you think of, when you think of the, just like they said, like the, the will of steel to be able to do this and press on and the, and the fact that she helped so many people, hundreds of people. Yeah. Um, you can't do anything but respect her. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and abs absolutely amazing. Um, increasing respect. Tubman's reputation influence commanded respect and not just among slaves who dreamed of gaining their freedom. Influential Northerners of both races sought her out. She spoke at rallies and in homes throughout Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Boston, Massachusetts, St. Catharines, Canada, and Auburn, uh, and Auburn, New York, where she eventually settled. People of prominence sought her out, such as Senator William Seward, who later became Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of State, and outspoken abolitionist and former, former slave Frederick Douglass. Tubman's advice and leadership were also requested by John Brown, the famed revolutionary abolitionist. Brown always referred to the former slave as General Tubman, and he was quoted as saying she was a better officer than most whom he had seen and could command an army as successfully as she had led her small parties of fugitives. That is the essence of the law of respect. So I would say character and competency and connection all played a huge part into her being able to gain respect because she went, she did hard things. She did risky things. She put her life on the line. We to, clearly, we are aware of how life and death this is, right? right? Um, and without wavering, she went and did it 19 times over and over again. It's not like, it's not like you're getting in a car and driving down and like, hey, get in, and yeah. we're gonna drive three hours back. I mean, this is on foot, in night. I mean, it, it's hundreds of miles, thousands of miles. Like, 19. 19 trips. I mean, you're lucky to get, you, they, you know. It takes at, a lot to even process. Right. And at the time, if, if, if you were lucky enough to escape, like the last thing you were trying to do is like, hey, let me go back and go get more. And, yeah. and so 
and I don't even think I don't even think that anyone alive today maybe they can't I don't I don't know but I'm just gonna say I can't fathom what that fear must have been like not even a try. I, 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 I I don't know if you ask me hey would you I, I don't know I don't I like I don't know I'm gonna probably go with no because that's that's some serious I couldn't do it yeah I'll tell you right now God bless her man um, a test of leadership Harry Tubman would appear to be an unlikely candidate for leadership because the deck was certainly stacked against her. She was uneducated. She lived in a culture that didn't respect African Americans. And she labored in a country where women didn't have the right to vote yet. Despite her circumstances, she became an incredible leader. The reason is simple. People naturally follow leaders stronger than themselves. Everyone who came in contact with her recognized her strong leadership, or recognized her strong leadership ability and felt compelled to follow her. That's how the law of respect works. You said, think of the, now we're uncovering more circumstances. Mm. So, circumstances. So it's like, you think of this life or death. You think of the cards stacked against her. But this was something she was committed to. This was something she had in her mind she was going to do. She was going to make an impact and nothing was going to stop her. She couldn't read, couldn't write could barely work to make enough money to, to get the means to do this. Yeah. But she went and got a ton, and she made an impact on 300 people instantly and brought them to freedom. She got it done. She definitely got it done. She, she definitely got it done. And, you know, so when you think of that, if you're that committed to something, if you're that engaged to something, if you're ready to go and you're going to go and get it done just, just get it done that's why i say it. just get it done if you're that committed you'll find a way mm -hmm. right but i like be oh well this oh well, that well what's your excuse you, you have all the means in the world today to get done what you need to get done and what's your excuse because you're tired <laughs> you're maybe don't have as much your job doesn't pay you as much money as you think it should we'll figure out a way to earn more money at your job be more valuable get yeah. another job get a second job change your job like oh well there's all oh, if the why is strong enough the how is there does that make sense and and, and she is an amazing embodiment of that um, which is why you can't do anything but respect that you know what I mean how For many sure. people would how many people would put their life on the line 19 times I mean, what if not even just their life? What if she, what if she got captured and was forced back into slavery? Right. You know what I mean? That's that's till that's 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 a death sentence you know, for the rest of your life. That's an elongated. You know what I mean? For yeah. however long she would have lived. In a scenario like that, I yeah. mean, that's that's horrifying. So. That is super terrifying. Yep. Damn. It's heavy. It is. It really is. I'd like to. Uh, <laughs> to say anything about it, I'm like, holy crap! Well, what can you say? Nothing. I mean, nothing. That, and that's like, that's why when I read this, I was, I was, I was kind of like, I put the book down. I said, I thought about it for a second, and I was just like, wow, like I don't, absolutely amazing. So, um, thank you, Harriet Tubman, for showing us what respect is, and um, thank you for putting your life on the line to commit. Right Stand to commit up. to what you were, what you believed in, and what you were doing, and 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 helping three hundred people who, God knows how many people, whose ancestors are that are that that may have helped. You know what I mean? Right. Especially looking back now, a hundred and whatever, sixty years later, like absolutely amazing. So you never know how far your reach goes. Right. Sometimes you know. Or how far it's going to go. Yeah. Along your imprint stays. No, and and and. Thankfully, we do have amazing examples like her in, in our history. Although there's a horrible reason why she had to do that, however, great examples. And, and that's, that's the good thing about human nature. There's always, there's always some, yes. there's always something positive that comes out of poor and horrendous and yep. challenging. Rise above. Yeah, so. Thank you, Ms. Tubman. Excellent. Excellent example. Thank you for being a leader we're following. 
Uh, the last part here that we have uh, put on here is it's not a guessing game. People don't follow others by accident. They follow individuals whose leadership they respect. Someone who is an eight in leadership on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the strongest, doesn't go out and look for a six to follow. He naturally follows a nine or a 10. The less skilled follow the more highly skilled and gifted. Occasionally a strong leader may choose to follow someone weaker than himself. But when that happens, it's for a reason. For example, the stronger leader may do it out of respect for the person's office or past accomplishments, or he may be following the chain of command. In general, though, followers are attracted to people who are better leaders than themselves. That is the law of respect. So, so how, does, how does the Underground Railroad and that story, how, how can we look at it through, through the lens of leadership? Um, the way the way I kind of find that bridge is I kind of find it through the ability to for the leader to do the hard things to when when tasks need to be done to jump in and get their hands dirty and say hey you know what we've got these three things that need to get done however I'm gonna jump on this one mm -hmm. if you guys can cover me and get these other things accomplished and then we'll meet when we're done you know and I'm gonna go and put my put my, myself out there. I'm gonna take that chance. I'm gonna get out there and own whatever this is that's going on and through leadership we can get it accomplished and get it done. That's how I can translate again the principles, not obviously the severity, but the principles. Yep. Um, does that make sense? Absolutely. Talk to me about a leader you respect in your past. Let's see. And tell me, and, and, and why he or she Oof. was someone that you were able to find credibility <clears throat> and respect. Instead of, I have another idea. Because Excellent. I'm just going to say you. So that's, and everybody's well, going to be like, oh, who's talking to you? I appreciate that. You make me blush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, good, we can get a good zoom in on that. <laughs> but I will say this. I'll say that when it comes to the leadership and, and finding a leader worth following. A lot of people, for instance, they come here and they start working here. And they're like, I work for Kyle G, right? Whenever you start a job and you meet a boss, you, you just like any, anyone else, you, you wait for them to prove you wrong. Like, man, at what point are you gonna be a dick? And a good friend of ours for 20 years just said to me the other day, he helped me move, and he was like, yo, Kyle's really about that life, isn't he? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, bro, every time I see him, he's like, hey, name, how are you? How is everything? How's, how's the wife? How's the kids? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah. He's like, he doesn't turn that off? I'm like, no. That's his character. That's how he is. So that's cool. where other bosses or leaders or people who think they're leaders, <clears throat> you know, they'll you kind of wait at what point to see that they're going to prove they're full of shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, And do. that's a really bad way to look at it, but people have been disappointed a lot, so they look to that. So my answer is obviously you, but because the first law of this, the, the first word you ever is character, and you know every employee's name, you know, you know, and that, that makes you a great leader worth following. So there's my answer. Cool. I'm not yeah. mad at that. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Uh, now everything's going to kiss us. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I haven't had a day job in like <laughs> 15 years. Been ago. retired for some time. I have been, yeah. Been my own boss. Been my own leader worth following. <laughs> How'd that work out? Pretty damn good. I know. I agree. <laughs> Until COVID. Until COVID. <laughs> Thanks, Vid. Well, that's all right. You're still, you're still knocking, out, knocking it out of the, the leadership. I mean, your weddings, you guys, every time I talk to you, I'm doing another wedding. Yeah, yeah. We're, um, you know, I'm blessed. I have a great team with me as well. And, you know, it's the same. We, we have the same principles. You know, it's um, say what you... You guys do have a good team. I like your guys' team. Say what you mean, mean what you say. You know, make sure that your communication is always key in our line. And subordinating your ego is probably the hardest thing to do for, for a DJ. Yeah, I would agree with that. Because it's everybody getting neck cramps from... Uh, Massaging themselves on the <laughs> back too much. Um, with that, with the law of respect, and with as as intense as that 
chapter is, I think it's a good place to stop because yeah. um, it's a lot of content to take in. It's a lot of, you know, human just rawness, if right. you will, you know, and um, I think it's a good place to stop. We've got a, we got a busy evening this evening on, on President's Day, the day after Valentine's Day. Um, Doug, tell us a little bit about what we can do to, uh, I don't know. Support the podcast. No, I was going to say something <laughs> different. I was, trying to, I was trying to be witty. I was going to say so that we can uh, give ourselves some reminders of how to <laughs> uh, have a little humility and keep I going. I think having a shirt that says humble pie would be a great idea to remember to serve yourself. Ties right in with what I just said, you know, with uh, even in my line of work with people that's a first slice should be your own. So we have that on reminders for t shirts. The links will be <laughs> there, wherever Andres puts them. There, here, okay. So we're going to put a, we'll have the links up there. We have a whole merch shop with um, a lot of our favorite quotes, um, and there is some comedy behind it, but it is also a, a healthy reminder that. You know, we have a shirt that says, figure it out. Get it done. I, I, get I wore, it done. You got to figure it out. I wore the get it done. I wore the get it done shirt to the gym the other day. And at first off, my trainer, he wants, he, he's going to come on the podcast. He was talking, he's like, he's got some good ideas. And I'm like, yeah, we'll get you on, John. Um, he was like, that's a great shirt to wear today. And I was like, oh, my workout just got a lot harder. <laughs> yeah, but you figured it out. I figured it out. I got it done. Boom. So. Uh, we have merch. Uh, we have shirts on there. Obviously, you guys get gift cards if you want to come support any of the brands, any of the restaurants. Uh, now that Valentine's Day is over, <laughs> you know, you guys can come sit and enjoy a meal. And we'll have to be around 5,000 people that we fed in the last three days. Three days, three restaurants, 5,000 guests. Absolutely. It's amazing. Uh, make sure you like the video. Feel free to share. And then make sure you click subscribe. And we put out content every week. Every week? We sit in front of a table every week. Ayala Films puts out the content every <laughs> week. So uh, that's that's what I got. Awesome. Um, the only thing I've got is... There's people getting sat behind us right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a party. It's a, um, it's a sweet 16. These are uh, they're the decorators. There's a cake table. There's two ten tops. There's... Is there a throne? Uh, not yet, but, you know, the so... night is still still early. Um, also, if you guys have any corporate events, private events coming up, check us out. Uh, Promenade on the River by Kyle G's. Promenade on the River by Kyle G's. Yeah, so. if you go to KyleGRestaurants.com, um, you can see all of our all of our operations go in there, and they can go to all the different uh, websites uh, for each brand. We the next holiday is Easter that's coming up April fourth, and then we go to the Mother's Day. Uh, oyster bar update on the oyster bar. There's drywall. There's drywall. There's paint. Uh, the ceiling grid's going in. Excellent. The equipment should be in in at least in in the warehouse by March fifth. The um, what else? The floor. There's tile being laid right now. So it's in another like week or two. Controlled chaos. It's going to look like a restaurant. Excellent. Which is exciting. We you know um, <laughs> what else? What else? We got a. It's a lot. That was our eight o'clock this morning meeting. It was. Yep. It was. See? What? Now we're, are we at 12 hours yet? Oh, uh, no. 10. No, oh, good. I ha get it in me. We're it's good. Only, it's only half a day. Figuring it out. Only half a day. Listen, <laughs> take your vitamins. Yeah. All right. Um, until next time, I've got to do some more work and go through some more chapters. But um, until next time, thank you very much for tuning in and listening. We're we, 50, 55 minutes and change. I did pretty good. You told me an hour. I said, "All right, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get it in there." I, I feel like I should keep. Yeah, see, yeah, yeah <clears throat> see. Hour Good. five. But who's counting? Hour five. Is it? <laughs> yep, that's why he's nodding his head. Wow. Well, <laughs> all you right. Know. Thank you guys. <laughs> he's gonna keep going. Oh, yeah, I want to get my extra five minutes. I'm just kidding. Uh, thank you guys very much for listening. Um, I, we've gotten a lot of great feedback and support for the podcast, so we're gonna keep it up weekly. Um, thank you, Ayala Films, again for listening to us banter for at least an hour, hour and five minutes today. Um, about leadership and things that are important to our quest and continuing to strive for greatness in our organizations and in our personal lives as well. So we'll see you in the restaurants or we'll see you uh, in your downloads on the internet. Bye guys. <laughs>